is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Magicians, Season 3, Episode 6. Do you like teeth? In this episode... Elliot and Margot figure out a way to trick this creepy little 15-year-old, and they also figure out why it is that Margot is raising fields and having her people plant mushrooms. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Matthew for commissioning this episode. I would like to say that right around when they like see that the orchards are gone and that there's just mushrooms, my immediate thought was, wait, are the fairies just actually mushrooms? And then it turns out that like, that's kind of exactly what it is. But I didn't really figure it out early enough to give myself much credit on that. So... I do really like the idea, though, because fairies, like, you know, stepping into a ring of fairy mushrooms is supposed to be, like, how you get transported to the fairy realm. So the idea that they are actually literally growing in, like, eggs that are attached to the mushrooms, that's pretty clever. I'm here for that. It's horrifying, and it's like a literal, like, science fiction movie, but I'm I'm all about it, so that's fine. Um Megan, Jesse, and Jean Marie are all here in the chat. Hello to all of you delightful people. So, yeah, this episode, there is a lot happening here. Can we just talk about Quentin just like right out of the gate? Can we just do that? Because you all were here for the rant that I went on last week. Or was it earlier this week? It was earlier this week. Basically, Quentin gets stuck with the version of me that was on that last episode. He is standing next to me, but it's not even like there's no like passion behind it. There's not me screaming at him like, what the fuck is the matter with you? It's just you suck, man. You are a drag. And honestly, if you guys think about it, any of you who experience depression there is nothing that I wouldn't rather face than something like this. This monster that he winds up with, you are literally being attacked by the most frightening thing, which is all of the worst parts of yourself. There isn't even the comforting Oh, I'm up against a terrible enemy whom I hate and can blame. It's you. You're the terrible enemy whom you hate and can blame. So that's no fun. What good is that? Nobody likes that. And it's telling you all of the things that you always already tell yourself anyway. And again, there's no passion behind it. It's not angry at you. It's disappointed. And it's telling you things that make total sense. You're right. All I do is ruin everything. Everybody whose life I've gotten involved with, it's worse now. Every person I've tried to help, not only have I not helped them, I've harmed them. And then I've tried to tell myself that I was doing something heroic. I have wound up Like the, the, even this monster even calls back to way back when you could have given Julia magic and you didn't because you just didn't want to help her. That's how far back shit is going. And, you know, I, in some ways, I actually kind of like that we're seeing Quentin going through this because that was my issue when I started to get so angry I say started. I just got there. I got too angry. It's fine. I got there and I built a house. Um, 
part of what I was so angry about was that it felt like he has never actually had to atone for the shit that he has pulled. Like he still hasn't learned from a lot of it. What went down with Julia, I'm sure if somebody sat down with him and was like, that was fucked up, he'd be like, yeah, it was fucked up. Like, I'm not trying to say he's still trying to justify that, but he's like still trying to justify the thing with Alice and still trying to like make it about him. And I like the fact that this monster is bringing up some shit that like it, one could very easily be like, oh, they're just trying to torture him. But there's a part of me that's like, this is shit that you haven't dealt with, like, as a person. This is, this is an opportunity for you to utilize some of what you hopefully learned in, like, therapy sessions when you were in the hospital. Um, and he says to this monster, when it finally, like, starts to become apparent what's going on here, I have a black belt, so bring it on. And I really hope... That's what we see here is somebody who is who has gone through therapy, who has gone through a lot of what it takes to treat mental illness, learning to utilize the tools that they were given and that he's able to overcome this because he has been privileged enough, really, to have access to care and instruction on coping and and moving past things. There's never really a time where you beat depression. I mean, you can be medicated and it's still not going to be getting to the heart of things sometimes. But not to say that you get to the heart of things and then you don't need meds anymore. That's not what I'm saying because that's insanity. Y'all know how I felt about the whole like getting rid of meds things uh, in this show and others. It's a red flag. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just find this really compelling and the way that it's depicted it's done really really well you can tell that the people writing this are people who have gone up against this sort of thing mentally before these are people who are familiar with that voice and i really do love too the way that it's just in the background just chiming in endlessly because when you're in a really bad place that's what it's like. You can't do literally anything, anything without this voice popping up and being like, oh, you're so fucking pathetic. I can't believe you can't even fucking do this right. Jesus Christ, this is base level shit. What the fuck is wrong with you? And it's just like, oh, my God, I'm trying to make a peanut butter and jelly. Holy shit. Are you serious? Are we really doing this? Like, it's just there's no activity that's safe there's nowhere you can go to get away with it, away from it um and that is the part that's so scary it's part of why in all reality that i can be such a workaholic if i'm doing work i'm not sitting alone with my thoughts and sometimes when i'm sitting alone with my thoughts it's not a terrible thing sometimes it calms me. Sometimes I get things organized in my brain. Sometimes I feel like I'm actually like relaxing. But there are days where I can feel that being alone with my thoughts is the last thing I want to do today. And that's not healthy. That coping mechanism of just working so that you don't notice how depressed you are is not healthy. But it is a fact that is part of what I do is I try and keep myself busy so that I don't have time to slow down and think about how unhappy I am. And then because I will literally guys, there have been days where I'm recording and I turn off the camera and there's 25 minutes before the start of the next one. And I just have to cry for 20 minutes before I start the next one, that that silence of turning off the mic, turning off the camera and being here in my office alone, that short break is too much time alone. And y'all know what I'm talking about. We all have the days where we're like, I'm just going to duck into the bathroom real quick and just like have a, have a little bit of a breakdown. Just 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 for a second. And then I'll go back out and I'll do my job and act like everything's fine. But just, you know, I just need to fall apart just real quick. Um. So 
what happens here is really like the way that it's set up is, you know, Quentin, first of all, he's like dressed up as a guard and is still working in the castle at like undercover, basically, um, which is pretty fun. I enjoyed that because they don't want the fairy queen to be aware that he is back. So he's in disguise. Um, there's a really sweet moment between him and Elliot where, because, you know, we've, I talked last time about what it could do to their relationship um, as friends, being able to remember this entire other lifetime that they had together. And I really love that we get to see this moment of them having like a heart to heart and there's genuine affection still there. Like this has changed things between the two of them. It has made them trust one another in a way that they didn't before. And I feel like there has to be a real reason for that. I feel like, and, and I may be overthinking things, but I feel like as much as I love a life in the day, just on, just for what it is, as a story. I think it's great. I really like the idea that somewhere else in this story, we're going to have a crisis of some kind in which Elliot is going to need to innately trust Quentin or vice versa, and that they will be able to draw on what they have learned about one another to inform their trust that this is going to be something that comes into play somehow. And right now, even though it's not like a, you know, they're not in a crisis moment, like they're able to actually communicate here, it's already paying off and it's really sweet. And I just, you know, I love this, this talk between the two of them. And he talks about this part of the Florian sea where it's kind of like permanently night, but you know, we get to go on a quest on a magical boat. So it doesn't totally suck. And he's trying to look on the bright side. And at this point, you know, Quentin's saying we, because he still thinks that Elliot is going to be able to come with him, but he's going to have to stay and deal with Margot because he's being ordered around by the fairy queen. And he's understanding about it. And it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But he says, I was looking forward to going on a boating quest with you. And Elliot says, who would it, who wouldn't? And they have this like sweet, embrace and you'll be able to do the thing on the prow of the ship you've been waiting your whole life to do. And he says, what thing? And he says, you know, the thing before he kisses him on the head. And I like to think that this is something that like he learned when they were like hanging out that he still somehow remembers. Um, so when we go to, and guys, I want to back up a little bit when I was like on vacation and thinking about the show, I hadn't, you know, I couldn't watch anymore, but I was uh, thinking about the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which um, is a boat boat mission book um, from from the Narnia series. And the Voyage of the Dawn Treader has been one of my favorites because it's such a strange story. It's a lot of like it's a very sort of uh, odyssey type journey from island to island, strange places, strange people, adventures. Um, it could be very easily done into like a sort of monster of the week TV show that goes on forever if you wanted. And when Elliot was off at this island dealing with this lying priest who's pretending that there's a monster, I kind of expected that Elliot wouldn't turn around and come right back to Fillory. I kind of thought that he was going to continue to sail around and encounter other Ob like obstacles and that he was going to be joined on the boat somehow by other people that were like by other by all of our crew basically that they would find keys or exchange keys and be able to open doors on the boat and jump in and off and he would maybe go back to the castle eventually but somebody else would take over the boat it hasn't turned out that way at all like they straight up just sail back um which I rather like, you know, being just on the boat would be kind of cool. And I'm not like mad about it. But uh, I do enjoy the surprise of returning back to the castle. And also like we need to deal with the fairy queen. And while having her be on the boat 
still works with involving her in the story. There is something about her being in the castle that because the boat's new to the story, I don't have the same sense of like possessiveness towards it that I do with the castle. Her being up in the castle and like on their thrones and shit is just straight up like unacceptable. Like that's just invasive and really rude and, and no, what are you doing? I don't feel that way about the boat because like, I don't really care about it that much yet. So I like the return to home base to really like visually remind us that she is up in our shit and she's not supposed to be here and we hate it. Um, but when he mentions this part about where it's always night, how many of you show of hands have read Voyage of the Dawn Treader? Because there is a part of that that I always found so incredibly creepy when I was a kid. And it is a really similar thing. Obviously, this whole deal with Fillory is taken from Narnia. So it's unsurprising that they like continue down this road. I know a lot of you who have uh, talked about having read the books, you said that the second season and third season wind up going way off from where the book is. I'm wondering, is this something that wound up coming up um, in the original series? Or is this like just the show writers? But we got a show of hands, three people here. Um, there is a portion of the sea that is in shadow. You can see the shadow coming. Now it's different with Quentin. They know it's coming. They know because it says on the map, here's the darkness. On the maps, like nobody, it, it, the, the conceit of Voyage of the Dawn Treader is that they're going places that nobody from uh, like Narnia proper has gone to in hundreds of years, right? Like it's not even hundreds. It's not that long, but it's like long enough that a lot of the stuff that is on these maps are being put down as legends are not true. And they see a wall of just night coming at them in the middle of the day. And they're just like, what the fuck is this? And everybody kind of wants to like not go into it because they're like, what good could possibly come out of that? But there's no way around it. And Reepicheep the mouse is the one who's like, are y'all a bunch of pussies? Because I really thought that y'all weren't a bunch of pussies. And I was about to be like really embarrassed about how everybody's acting scared of the fucking dark. And all of the dudes on the ship are just like, God damn it. Fine, Reepicheep. Fine. And they sail into the dark. And they wind up coming across a dude floating on a raft. And the dude tells them, you are coming to a place where dreams come true. And everybody is like, no shit. That's awesome. Some guy says something about how like his girlfriend will be alive again. Somebody else is talking about like when, when he says dreams come true, it's all this like really touching thing that people are hoping is real. And he has to interrupt and be like, shh, shh, shh. no. I did not say daydreams. I said dreams. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, fuck. And it slowly transitions from this like actual conversation that people are having to everybody suddenly hearing things. And somebody's like, do you do you hear them crawling up the sides of the boat? And somebody else says, can anybody hear what some, it sounds like a giant pair of scissors opening and closing over there. And I swear to God, as I was reading this as a little kid, I was like, fuck no, absolutely not. Like I was so flipped out. There was something about that. They're in the dark and hearing things and you don't see any of it, but it's there. Clearly something's happening. And it becomes this like, everybody's starting to slowly lose it, right? Like they're about to just basically throw themselves into the water to get away from the perceived threat that they think is coming for them, whether it's real or not. Like if there's a physical thing there, I don't know, but the sound is there. And eventually this, um, I believe an albatross shows up. That's like basically supposed to be Aslan shining light onto the boat and brings back clarity and they're able to like come back to themselves. To me, what they've done here with this like depression monster is a very similar idea, but like more adult. So instead of it being just literal nightmare creatures, 
it's like, well, what's the worst thing though? What's like way worse than that? When you're a kid, a terrible monster is the most frightening thing. When you're a grown up, what's the thing that you're most afraid of? That you are a loser fuck up who will never do or be anything and will die a pathetic, sad failure. Like, right? What we're most of us the most afraid of is never succeeding in any way that means anything to us. And the best way to demonstrate that in a way that we can see is to have those fears be a separate entity that comes at you with everything it's got. So I fucking love this whole idea because it's like tapping into the real, like there is for something like it by Stephen King, the kids are easier to terrorize than adults because adults are afraid of such sort of esoteric stuff that like getting them frightened isn't really as easy to do. But I like that the show, these writers are like, oh, isn't it? I think it's just as easy to do. It's going to look different. It's going to be different. But don't get it twisted. We are just as scared all the time of everything as kids are. It just means something else now. And this is smart, you know, because who is going to know better where to attack you? The, the places to poke at you than you. Somebody who's been there the whole time in lurking in the darkest recesses of your brain saving up every scrap of criticism, noting every little bump in the road and putting it all on a list so that they can just roll that shit out, you know, and, to, and, and, and read it nonstop until you're dead. Oh, okay. So there is a person that they wind up finding. And I really thought that she was going to be like, this is uh, the place of, of evil dreams. I thought that's where we were just doing that. But what's weird about it is she says something about how she survived for three weeks on a raft. This bitch is healthy and cheery. It was already to me like, mm-hmm. no, you didn't. What's your deal, bitch? Like, I wasn't trusting this at all, right? And I still don't. Because I don't know how she survives on a raft for three weeks all alone without food or water and then is like able to stand around and talk and be cheery. Don't, I don't buy it. I don't think so. But it, and she keeps looking over her shoulder too. And honestly, guys, I thought she was looking at fairies straight up. I thought she had made a deal with the Fae and that's how she had survived for three weeks and that they were following her around and Basically, I thought that this was going to dovetail with like um, Quentin having hidden in the castle and pretended that he was like a guard. I thought this was going to turn out to be like the Fae getting at Quentin and finding out that he was here another way, um, which I guess could have worked, but it, it turns out to be nothing like that. She is looking over at the ugly version of herself that is talking to her. And when she says something about having questionable morals, I feel like that's part of what insulates her is that it seems like she isn't as bothered by this thing talking to her. It She looks over at it. She's aware of it and she doesn't look happy that it's there, but it's not like completely shaking her world up. And I think that is an indicator that maybe she doesn't have a whole lot of shame because maybe she's fine with being kind of a shitty person. There are some people that are just like that, you know? And I mean, to be perfectly honest, I envy them sometimes. How great would that be? Like as much as it wouldn't really, because you know, as somebody on the outside who looks at people like that and hates them, you know that people would actually really despise you. But you wouldn't be aware that they despise you. So like, who cares, really, when it comes down to it? I don't know that it matters that they despise you. And I feel like that's kind of where she she is just like, yeah, I survived. I managed to be the one to make it out. 
And uh, I'm not apologizing for that. I don't really feel bad about that. It sucks for them. I'm not happy they're dead. But also, like, what are you going to do? You know? And also, I should mention that she is played by uh, What's Her Face from that show, The Guild. Is that the one that is that the way it's called? Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. Felicia Day. Thank you, everybody who popped up at the exact same time, having written her name out. Y'all are precious. I love you. Um, And she plays like kind of uh, sociopathic pretty well. I thought that she was killing this. I liked her. I hope that she doesn't go away forever. We'll see what happens there. Um, But yeah, so Quentin winds up like figuring out what the fuck because she makes him touch the key while he's drunk which is just so gross. He wakes up and this thing is standing there and he goes at her and it's just like, what the fuck did you do? And she tells him that it's sort of like it follows. Um, Those of you who have seen that horror movie where it's like the last person it's coming at them. But if you are able to hand it off to somebody else, then it begins to torment that person. The difference is with it follows is it won't come at you after that person's dead. It follows. Eventually it will catch up to you probably. But with the key, that's not how it works, I guess. Like if somebody dies with it, that's the end of it until somebody picks it up again. Um, so he tells, uh, what's the name of the guy? The poor little dude who gets eaten by a dragon. Precious little cinnamon roll. He's so sweet. Um, but he tells him to tie himself quentin up to the the mast of the ship he's doing basically an odysseus type deal um because he cannot be trusted to not hurl himself overboard because he is considering suicide every second essentially um and i really like when he when he starts talking to uh and what is her name again? I'm trying to remember what the, what Felicia's character's name is. It's like um, Poppy, I think. Um, she is, he tells her that she is, uh, that the keys have been ma- like managed to transport him to and from Fillory or that they have like gone to the Netherlands and yada, yada, yada. And when she says this, or when he says this, she's like, wait. Are you fucking serious? Because she wasn't aware that they had this power and I guess just didn't. I don't know if it's just like a keyhole pops up and she didn't notice it or if no keyholes pop up unless you're looking for them or unless there's like an, a need for it all of a sudden. I don't know how they appear, but she grabs it away and is basically like, I'm going to go home. Fuck all this nonsense. I'll even deal with the depression monster because as long as I'm home, I can hand it off to somebody else again. She has no problem with putting this onto other people. Quentin is not interested because as far as he is concerned, he is equipped to deal with a thing like this and he will beat it or he will die and it will end with him. But he needs the key, first of all. And second of all, as he put it, he has a black belt. And if he lets somebody else handle this thing, they may not survive it. He's all too aware. She doesn't care. So she grabs the thing back. And Quentin tells uh, his little friend to go and get the key back. At first he says, untie me. The guy's like, you told me not to do that no matter what you said. And he's like, fine, fine. Just stop her. Okay. And guy's like, okay. He goes down. He like fights with her to get the key Um, to stop her from going and it winds up that he touched the key so when he comes back upstairs he's like i am such a failure i'm so sorry and he's just staring like really spaced out and quentin realizes what's going on it's like dude don't listen don't you do it don't listen to it dude and uh he jumps off and then a dragon pops up and has eaten him What we learn here is that dragons are not just portal creators. They are in and of themselves portals. So when a dragon swallows a person, they don't die. Or maybe they do die, but they don't get shit out again. They 
wind up being sent somewhere. I'm really curious. Oh, Matthew says, I want to say his name is Benedict. Okay. I don't know if Benedict, if Ben has been sent to the underworld as a living person who just went through a portal, or if it's supposed to be that like he was crushed to death in the jaws of this thing and swallowed. And now he is alive, but in the underworld, I don't know how this goes, but I don't know why we're assuming that the portal he went through is the underworld portal. Like if, if dragons are portals, how do you know what portal he went through? And if he got killed in any other way, wouldn't he wind up in the underworld as well? Also, I guess it's not about him. It's about the key really and where the key winds up um yeah i just had a little bit of trouble following like the the chain of logic that they had going on here um hugabug says in the book her character is completely different she's the most normal well-adjusted person in their group oh so she's a book character i didn't expect that um oh and yeah and she knows josh as well which is pretty fun i like that detail as well she's part of that that 2016 class that all fucking wound up here um, so they, the, you know, new mission now is going to be having to go back to the underworld and, uh, getting that key. So, all right, let's back up to what's going on with Margot and this fucking child. She's walking down the hallway and she, I don't know if she is like, she is is talking to the queen of the cloud mountain tribe, floating mountain tribe. Um, and this queen is talking to her about how she has heard a rumor that Flea has been spotted taking scrapings from the wall in the hallway of uh, allergic stone and that she has figured out Margot is dealing with this fairy queen and that she also has dealings with the fairy queen and wants this bitch taken out of the equation. Margot is playing it very cautious and just keeps on saying things like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now, I don't know where Margot gets her lip color, but y'all, I am going to need it. Can anybody like fucking track down the makeup artists and get a list episode by episode of what lip color Margot was wearing in every single episode? Because this bitch's look is always just so it's flawless. I want it. Frankly, really what I want is Margot's whole face. I would like it. But in the absence of that, I'll settle for name and brand, please. Because, uh, look, it's just so, it's just, it makes me so mad. She looks so amazing. Every eye patch she has, too, is so dope. Um, so this woman is talking to Margot, trying to act like, oh, no, sweetie, we're both on the same side. I don't, Margo says something about like, oh, don't worry. Uh, the marriage, like, uh, it hasn't been consummated yet, but, and, um, it won't be like, she's trying to act like the, the queen is like, oh no, Margo, you've got me all wrong. The misguided actions of my son have soured both sides in our arrangement. But then they open the doors for wherever. I don't know where Margot thinks she's going. If she thinks she's going to like have a private audience with this queen or what, but she's being brought to a dungeon with a giant fucking bed in it. And they lock her in there. And she is like yelling at her guards to let her out. And for some reason they are not coming. I don't know how this queen organized this whole thing. Or if it's just the fact that like, According to the law, they are married and therefore nobody is going to help her because this is like actually within the rules, her duty. 
But I would like to repeat my frustration with the fact that this dude murdered someone and confessed to it. And apparently that's just a fine thing that we can all just move on with and not talk about. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense, but whatever. So Elliot gets talked to by the queen. Basically, she tells him, you are going to figure out a way to make Margot consummate this marriage or I am going to take your dick and balls and put them in this cage around my wrist, essentially. And he agrees to help, but he doesn't know exactly what he's going to do. And he finally comes up with the idea of saying, okay, you know what it is? They need a honeymoon. They're not going to be mating in captivity like a couple of zoo animals. They need to be sent somewhere where they can have some privacy, get to know one another, and the queen agrees to this, the fairy queen, which seemed a little unlikely to me, but also I don't know how much she like is aware of Elliot's deviousness. She's gotten a look at Margot, but I don't know if she's really gotten the measure of Elliot yet. And so the next time we see them, they're all in a carriage riding together and he's like really encouraging Margot to drink this wine that he has poured. I would like to mention that the glasses they're drinking from in the carriage and the bottle and glasses that Quentin drinks from with Polly on the ship are some of the most beautifully designed glassware. And I want them so much. They are really, really pretty. Lots of uh, gold leaf and really intricate like um, etching on the glass. And it is just stunning. It's so pretty. Um, and somehow Margot drinks it and nothing happens, but the son, what is his name again? This kid, he is continually asking. And I, I really like the fact that they cast a boy who looks like he's 15 years old. You know, they could have cast one of those like actors that's, that is obviously 35 playing a teenager, but they cast somebody who he probably is like 25, you know, but he looks like a child. So it's just made so much more creepy every time he pipes up and is like, so are we going to bang? I'm just like, ah, oh, dude, stop. You're so creepy. But yeah, he gets passed out and Margot and Elliot are finally left to talk over what the fuck is going on. Um, I really love her saying, like, is everything cool between us? And them talking out the fact that things are still a little weird. Um, and she says something about how they used to be such glamorous mega bitches and look at us now. And he says, well, we have depth and character. And guys, the expression on her face I'm screenshotting this right now and I'm going to share it in the comments on this post. Ah, oh, shit. I hate when that happens. Um, I'm going to share it in the comments on the post for this in the group because she looks so like it's just flawless acting. There's no hint of like I'm doing a bit of a uh, uh, j like an in joke between the two of us in this scene. It really just looks like she's genuinely going what language did you just start speaking? What the fuck was that that you just said? It is just great. I love her so much. Um, and he says, let's decide. We'll find us again once we're done saving Fillory. Okay. And they shake hands on it. And I was just like, oh, you guys be good to each other. So they get out of the carriage because they are supposedly at the orchards. And when they get out, it is nothing but CGI mushrooms as far as the eye can see. Um, and they can't figure out what the fuck is going on because not only are there mushrooms where there should have been trees, but these things like the air that they are standing in feels different. Everything is fucking humid and moist. And Margot says something about how, you know, it's weird, actually. I didn't really think about it, but they're always like moisturizing at the castle as well. She's always like bathing and like, there's just so much water shit going on with all of them. And then they start to think maybe they're terraforming. So as they can take over all of Fillory, like straight up. And one of the mushrooms moves 
And she's like, she says, should I pluck it? And I was like, girl, don't touch it. No, but I'm glad that she did. I didn't think it was a good idea, but she does. And a whole ass alien from the movie Alien Egg is attached to this fucking root system of this mushroom. It is the worst thing ever. It is so creepy. And what she winds up doing is collecting several of them to use as hostages later. I am real curious how that's going to go because they have acres of these shits growing. Are these six going to be like particularly important? I, I mean, the only thing that I could see is that they were growing from a fairy ring of red mushrooms versus the plain white mushrooms that all the others were growing from. So perhaps these are royal family mushrooms. I don't know. But yeah, this is like, this is a big deal because once Elliot starts talking about it, he says, think about all the crazy shit they've kept us busy with. Earthworms, adolescent slug mash, turtle semen. This is all just a thin frosting of whimsy on a cupcake of conspiracy. This is a full scale invasion. And he turns around and he's still talking to himself. And we can see that like Margot has left and we don't know that she left left. I thought maybe the fairies had like descended and taken her again. And it's clear that he kind of thinks that as well when he turns around and he's she's not there. He's kind of like, oh, fuck. But then she comes running off, uh, running in from off screen with these fucking creepy water balloon mushroom things. And I love when she says, hostages don't ask questions. And he just says, what the fuck? And runs after her and gets into the carriage. I I do not know what is going to happen next, but I love this whole development. I love it. When later on we return to the carriage, the two of them are riding, trying to figure out what the fuck they're like going to do next. Oh, thank you. Matthew says Fomar is his name. I understand not remembering that. Yeah, definitely not. Um, but when they... Uh, she pulls over at one point and picks up a toad and or a frog and uh, she says something about how Prince S was right and that they have teeth and so apparently what they do is they pull out this kid's dick stick his dick in the frog's mouth have the frog bite his dick and then tell him that they had sex and she had already mentioned teeth earlier that like vaginas have teeth. He says, guys, there's an amazing moment where she's trying to creep him out with like vagina facts to keep him from ever wanting to have sex. And she says something about how they just bleed every month and hers is doing it right now. And he says, that's okay. I like blood. And you can see her looking at him like, I just can't deal with how disturbing you are. Like there's just this moment of just like, Oh my God, what am I supposed to say to somebody like this? Like, so yeah, the teeth thing is what she like, what finishes out that scene. And then here he wakes up and he's like, Oh no, my manhood, something hurt. It bit it. And, uh, the two of them tell him essentially, congratulations, you're not a virgin anymore. And I love the fact that earlier he had been saying to Margo, so are we going to have sex in the carriage or do we do it outside? And he was saying this right in front of Elliot, who is sitting literally directly there. But then now when Elliot's like, oh, I like to watch, he's all creeped out by it all of a sudden. You were just about to fucking like jump this chick. What? You don't get to suddenly have boundaries. What are you talking about? Like, get out of here. Um, so they can pretend that this has been consummated and, uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see what winds up going down with that. If it's like believed by anybody else, because like, you know, if he tells his mother, yeah, yeah, we had sex, but I don't want to do it again too soon because I'm my, my dick is still recovering from the last bite. His mom is going to be like, okay, 
what the fuck did she do? And inform him that like, yeah, it was not consummated and she will know it wasn't. So like, hopefully he doesn't share with his mom what went down or anyone else who like talks about it. But, uh, you know, it, it, this will hopefully buy some time. Right. Um, so let's go back to Alice and Julia. It turns out that there is a, uh, a kind of spell that is meant to transfer magical ability from one being to another using aluminum wiring, which is like something that's kind of hard to find nowadays because everything uses like microchips and shit. So Julia is gathering as much like weird random shit as possible to pull it apart as she can. And what we see later is this like weird tree built out of like a Furby with Tamagotchis hanging off it. And like, it's just a, what looks like like Game Boy screens. And it's really funny. And they are each connected to it doing this spell. And all of a sudden the fish on the play guys, you know, these fish, <sighs> these fish are so annoying, man. The one that my friend, uh, his dad had would always sing, um, sitting on the dock of the bay. Oh my God. It was the worst because that song will just get in your head forever. Like, so this thing starts to go off and a keyhole appears on it. So of course they're thinking like, Oh my God, is this like, is this the thing? Um, like they're each grabbing it. Oh, oh, it's not a keyhole appears on it. Why does Alice grab the key then? She just knows that that's Penny. I'm realizing now as I look at it, it's just a plaque. The plaque that's underneath the fish for like the joke. So she just knows that it's going off because of Penny, I guess. Um, well, whatever the case, he tells the both of them, do not do this. Um, I've been trying to warn you guys for an hour. He says, this spell, I've seen it in person and everybody wound up on fire on a book stealing job. A group of magical starved idiots do the transfer. By the end of it, everyone was on fire. Yeah. So I really would love to have seen that. I would have loved to be in on some of his adventures going and, and recovering these books. But uh, hearing about them from him is still pretty fun. And he says, trust me, Fogg was right. It's a bad idea. And the he realizes that he shouldn't have said that because when he... The, apparently he knows that that was Fogg's spell, which... I don't know how like he is the is it that the people stole the book from Fog, but he's a librarian. So it had to be a book that was in the library, right? Because Fogg says it's from his private collection. So how does Penny make this connection here? I don't understand this part, guys. Somebody wants to explain it. Help me out. Because what he says something about how it was stolen by Marina. Um. And that it was part of his private collection. And he's really mad because Fogg is because Julia has magic and nobody decided to tell him. To which they're like, dude, you have been nothing but drunk this entire time. And he says, yeah, no, I might be drunk, but I'm still reliable. It's fine. Marina stole it from my private collection. And if any of you had attended my annual colloquia on prohibited magic, you would know that its proper name is the Voltaic Transfer and it is incredibly delicate. Um, and Julia starts to interrupt and be like, yeah, we know, but, and he says, e you know, but what you just want to give away the one thing all of us have desperately been searching for. 
I'm supposed to like feel for you on this and empathize because I don't at all, actually, and I'm pissed still. Um, Huggabug says, I don't think the spell was in the book he went to retrieve. They were just doing the spell when he went to pick the other book up. So then Huggabug, how does he know about Fog and his connection to the spell? Because he says Fog was right, like him and Fog were talking about it. I, like, there's something about the way that he tells the story that makes me feel like there was a scene that got cut somewhere and they had shown us these people lighting on fire and him having this conversation with Fog and that we just haven't gotten to see it for whatever reason. But I just don't understand that. Huggabug says, I think Katie might have said something about the spells she got for Marina. Oh. Intr okay. Maybe that's a hell of a leap though. I would really like it if they explained that. Um, well, never mind. So yeah, he tells her, I'm a magician with no magic, a dean without a school, just a blind, unemployed black man in America, which shockingly was actually being kept 38% more tolerant through a series of enchantments, which have now died. Which, uh, that feels like something that could be true. In case you hadn't noticed, perhaps maybe you weren't. And Alice interrupts with, in a pos he says, in a position to need to. And they, she says, okay, you're really drunk. And he just says, so what? And honestly, I have never identified with him more than that moment of just, so what? <laughs> Fair. Fair, fair, sir. Um, so, yeah. In the end, jumping ahead, they succeed in transferring the magic. Now, the issue is they don't... Oh, and I should mention that Julia uh, gets out his glasses and puts an enchantment on them so that he can see... I don't know how well... It seems like his vision is mostly restored with this enchantment. But um, the the transfer of magic, it becomes pretty clear. I had already been worried because of the changes that Alice went through that made her a little bit more ruthless, a little bit less able to relate to other human beings and their emotions. Her being the one with power just kind of alarmed me. But what it seems is happening by the end of the episode because she's trying to attempt a spell and it's not like it's the first time she attempted because she refreshes the Dean's eyeglasses and it doesn't cause any problem for her. But when she tries to use some bones that she found and mend them together because she offers to make Penny a new body, that is when shit goes left and she collapses and essentially is like in the middle of having a seizure when the episode ends. My assumption here is that somehow Julia is uniquely positioned because of her proximity to multiple gods at this point to handle the power that she has been given because I don't think what she has been able to do is precisely on the same level as the kind of magic that everybody else has been able to do this entire time. Like it, because the way that our lady underground describes it, she says something like, um, I've given a seed like for you to grow. And there's something about that phrasing. First of all, it's way too close to like, pregnancy and that whole concept considering that she got knocked up by her rapist who is the son of this chick don't use that phrasing but there's something about that for me that feels like just she is equipped for it in a way that's very specific so I don't know if that's what it is or if Alice is having some sort of reaction to the actual bones she's using like maybe there's something going on with that 
or if because Alice is like in a constructed body that isn't actually the body that she had before trying to do spells that involve like human physiology like fucks her up I don't know what the deal is here but what it comes down to with Alice is like she is interested in helping Penny because Penny has a another moment of watch like it winds up working in the end but he's watching Alice and Julia again trying to exchange power using this like aluminum wire method and he can see that the wire is coming loose that the both of them are in huge danger again and he is about to fucking pop he is so stressed out because it's just on the edge of failing and hurting the two of them really badly and he can do nothing to stop it and his uh, creepy pervert peeping Tom buddy, Hyman, um, he shows up and basically is like, dude, you always try and act like you don't care. And I see you out here freaking out all the time. You clearly care a lot. And I think the best thing for your mental health is to go somewhere with people who aren't constantly doing this kind of incredibly dangerous shit. So that you are not always about to explode from anxiety. Getting yourself out of here might be the best thing for you. And when he first says that, Penny seems pretty skeptical. But he begins, apparently, to like think it over and be like, you know what? Maybe that would be the best thing for me. So when he like talks to Julia and by the way I'm going to back up real quick but Julia has been having some weird nightmares she falls asleep out in the park and has a dream that Reynard is there and he tells her that he thinks it's really cute how she keeps trying to move past everything but the fear is always going to stay with her so what we're supposed to get from that is, you know, she is passing on this magic to Alice in an attempt to escape what happened to her, hoping that that will make her feel better and less violated and help her get over everything faster. And that is not actually how that works. Now, I get that in theory. I get being like, yeah, that's not going to help. And maybe it won't. But I said it already how tired I am of Julia's like free will being infringed upon all the time. And she doesn't get to choose to be the last conduit of human magic on Earth. Like this isn't something that was asked. Are you interested? And it's told to her very flat out that this is power that comes from Reynard specifically, which is gross. So like. Maybe it's not, you can't run away from that, but I don't blame her even one tiny little bit for wanting to be rid of that. Not at all. It's, it's the kind of thing where it's like, if somebody, let's say, uh, like there are people, for example, who will get a, uh, settlement, um, after like a lawsuit due to sexual assault or harassment. And if people want to just like live on that, like, I'm not mad at them for that. I'm not saying that. But there are people out there who are like, I don't want to feel like anything that I have is due to this person who hurt me. Like I owe them or something like that. So no, I'm not going to keep this money. I'm going to donate it or I'm going to do, you know, X, Y, Z with it. Um, and it feels like a similar thing to me. Where it's simply like, I don't want anything that connects me to this person anymore. And even though it's something that other people want and they would be glad to have, they don't have the trauma associated with it that I do. And of course, they're going to feel differently about it and not really understand where I'm coming from with this. So yeah, Dean Fogg just being like, oh, so you just didn't want to tell me about how you still have magic and don't you understand what it's like for me not having it? And I'm like, yeah, but don't, don't you understand what it's like for her? being told that this came directly from her rapist by her rapist mother like dude you know um so yeah i uh i don't know what to think about what's going to happen here if she's going to want to take the power back 
because that seems like where we're heading is that we're going to find out it was given to her and it is hers to use and Alice can't. And now she has to decide to take it back willingly. And this is going to be like the way that we sort of circumvent her free will being violated the first time is that she's going to choose to take it back. But the thing is, it's not exactly free will. The Like when your friends being held hostage and having a seizure, if you don't take it back. So I don't know. Um, so anyway, Penny, uh, is like meets with her and tells her goodbye. Um, and she, he's when she's like acting sad about it, he tells her we were never close. Don't suddenly act like you're sad just because I'm going. And she says, I don't want to see you go. I'm not acting. I don't want to see you give up. And he says, give up. And she says, yeah. And he says, you're the one who had magic and you gave it away. And I was just like, what the fuck again, dude? Like everybody's just like ignoring. And I don't know, maybe she hasn't told them where it's coming from. Maybe that like she hasn't shared it, but shit, I just am so tired of everybody just like bagging on her all the time. Um, and he says, what's your plan? Go back to law school, live off your trust fund. And she says, no, my plan was to take five minutes and try to remember what life was like without a God or a quest or some dead asshole bothering me. And frankly, beyond that, it's none of your business. And he says, cause you have nothing beyond that. Where the fuck does he get off talking to her like this? Go fuck yourself, Penny. You don't know her. You just straight up told her we were never close. And now you're acting like you know her life. Get the hell out of here. I understand the writers need somebody to deliver this message so that she suddenly gets a wake up call. But it coming from Penny feels totally disingenuous and really shitty and doesn't feel real to me at all. I He was the wrong vessel to use to deliver this message to her. I hated it. The only explanation I will accept is that we find out later. He doesn't remember saying any of this to her because he was taken over by some other being who used him as a puppet because otherwise this is bullshit, frankly, and I am not interested. Um, so yeah, they get interrupted by Alice coming in and this is when she's like, well, why don't I just make you a new body? And I'm like, Oh my God. All right. We're just going to do that and act like that isn't something that we should have talked about right away. So yeah, she uh, begins on that and winds up on the ground, foaming at the mouth. Didn't go super well, in other words. So we'll see what happens. I'm very curious, but I'm mad at Penny. I'm just mad at him. I don't like him for doing this. I don't like the way he said this. I don't like the way he acted. I don't like the presumptions he made. I'm mad at him. So there it is. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you very much for coming and hanging out with me, everybody. Thank you again to Matthew for commissioning this episode. I am going to wrap it up. If anybody has like a good in-depth explanation about what the hell was going on with Penny talking about Dean Fogg, I am unsatisfied. So uh, get at me with your theories and I will see you again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>